Good morning. At Fountain Street, we strive for lives that are meaningful and make a difference to us, to those we love, and to the community at large. We come here together to help each other along the path. My name is Mary Robb. My grandmother first introduced me to Fountain Street when I was a teenager. I've been attending here since the last days of Duncan Littlefair. Duncan Littlefair was larger than life and a force to be reckoned with. Even now, 10 years after his passing, just the mere mention of his name can spark controversy. It takes a leader of considerable courage to follow in the footsteps of such a formidable man, and I believe we have such a man of courage in Reverend Wooden. But any church leader, even Duncan Littlefair, can only be as strong as the congregation that stands with him. Sadly, I've witnessed Fountain Street's roar reduced to a whisper, and I so want to hear that roar restored. Fountain Street is not about I and me. It never has been. It's not about the individual and what the individual wants. Fountain Street is about we and what we can do together to make ourselves and our church community stronger and heard in order to make a difference. It can't come from just one person, however hard he tries. To paraphrase President John F. Kennedy, ask not what Fountain Street can do for you, but what you can do for Fountain Street. I wish to make a call today to all of you to use your creativity, your ideas, your talents. How can we make Fountain Street stronger? How can we restore the roar? Thank you. So, Christmas leftovers or ornaments? I'm not sure, but there are some wonderful poems and passages that I don't get to share except at a moment like this. For example, there are two that are very, I have three funny poems about Christmas. Uh, one of them is anonymous. One is by Mick Gower, and the other is by Phyllis McGinley, and they all have to do with writing. Anybody here get a Christmas card? Anybody here wish that they didn't have to send Christmas cards? Or thank you notes. Anybody here actually still send thank you notes? Good on you. That's the first one by Mark Gower. I've read this before, but it's so adorable that once a year it's worth reading again. Christmas thank yous. This is a British book, the Oxford Book of Christmas Poems. I resort to it constantly to make me look good. It's written of a child writing thank you notes, and each of them is a, each verse is a separate thank you note. Dear Auntie, oh what a nice sweater. I've always endured powder blue and fancy you thinking of orange and pink for the stripes. How clever of you. Dear uncle, the soap is terrific. So useful and such a kind thought. And how did you guess that I just used the last of the soap that last Christmas brought? Dear Gran, many thanks for the hankies. Now I really can't wait for the flu and the daisies embroidered in the red round the M for Michael. How thoughtful of you. Dear cousin, what socks? And the same sort you wear, so you must be the last word in style. And I'm certain you're right that the luminous green will make me stand out a mile. Dear sister, I quite understand your concern. It's a risk sending jam in the post. But I think I've pulled out all the big bits of glass. <laughs> so it won't taste too sharp when spread on toast. <laughs> Dear granddad, don't fret. I'm delighted, so don't think your gift will offend. I'm not at all hurt that you gave up this year and just sent me a fiver to spend. <laughs> Phyllis McGinley, in writing about Christmas cards, writes with a more ironic tone, lady selecting her Christmas cards. Fastidiously, with gloved and careful fingers, through the marked samples, she pursues her search. Which shall it be? 
the snowscapes, wintry langurs, complete with church, an urban skyline, children sweetly pretty sledding downhill, the chaste ubiquitous wreath, schooner or candle, or the simple scotty with birch underneath. Perhaps it might be better to emblazon with words alone the stiff punctilious square. Oh, not Victorian, certainly. This season one meets it everywhere. She has a duty proper to the weather. A birth she must announce, a rumor to spread, wherefore the very spheres once sang together and a star shone overhead. Here are the tidings which the shepherds panted one to another, kneeling by their flocks, and they will bear her name, engraved, not printed. 1250 for the box. And this anonymous, frequently read, never too often to be read at Christmas time. December 25th, my darling, dearest darling Edward, what a wonderful surprise just greets me. A, that sweet partridge in that lovely pear tree, what an enchanting, romantic, perfect present. Bless you and thank you, your deeply loving Emily. December 26th, beloved Edward, the two turtle doves arrived this morning and are cooing away in the pear tree as I write. I'm, I'm so touched and grateful with undying love as always, Emily. December 27th, my darling Edward, you do think of the most original presents. Who ever thought of sending anybody three French hens? Do they, do they really come all the way from France? It's a pity we have no chicken coops, but I'll expect we'll find some. Anyway, thank you so much. They're lovely. Your devoted Emily. December 28th. What a surprise! Four calling birds arrived this morning. They are very sweet, even if they do call rather loudly. They make telephoning almost impossible, but I expect they'll calm down when they get used to their new home. Anyway, I'm very grateful. Of course I am. Love from Emily. December 29th. Dearest Edward, the mailman just delivered the five most beautiful gold rings, one for each finger, and all fitting perfectly. A really lovely present. Lovelier in a way than birds, which do take rather a lot of looking after. The four that arrived yesterday are still making a terrible row, and I'm afraid none of us got much sleep last night. Mother says she wants to use the rings to wring their necks. Mother has such a sense of humor. This time she's only joking, I think, but I do know what she means. Still, I love the rings. Bless you, Emily. December 30th. Dear Edward, whatever I expected to find when I opened the front door this morning, it certainly wasn't six sucking great geese laying eggs all over the porch. Frankly, I rather hoped you had stopped sending me birds. We have no room for them, and they've already ruined the croquet lawn. I know you meant well, but let's call a halt, shall we? <laughs> Love, Emily. December 31st. Edward, I thought I said no more birds. <laughs> this morning I woke up to find no more than seven swans all trying to get into our tiny goldfish pond. I'd rather not think What's happened to the goldfish? The whole house seems to be full of birds, to say nothing of what they leave behind. So please, please stop your Emily. January 1st. Frankly, I prefer the birds. <laughs> what am I to do with eight milkmaids and their cows? Is this some kind of a joke? If so I'm afraid I don't find it amusing, Emily. December 2nd, January 2nd. Look here, Edward. This has gone far enough. You, you say you're sending me nine ladies dancing. All I can say is, judging from the way they dance, they're certainly not ladies. <laughs> the village just isn't accustomed to seeing a regiment of shameless viragos with nothing on but lipstick cavorting around the green, and it's Mother and I who get the blame. If you value our friendship, which I do, Less and less. Stop this ridiculous behavior at once. January 3rd. As I write this letter, 
10 disgusting old men are prancing up and down all over what used to be the garden before the geese and the swans and the cows got at it. And several of them, I just noticed, are taking inexcusable liberties with the milkmaids. <laughs> Meanwhile, the neighbors are trying to have us evicted. I shall never speak to you again. <laughs> Emily, January 4th. This is the last straw. You know I detest bagpipes. The place has now become something between a menagerie and a madhouse, and a man from the council has just declared it unfit for habitation. At least Mother has been spared this last outrage. They took her away yesterday in an ambulance to a home for the bewildered. I hope you're satisfied. January 5th. The twelfth day. Sir, our client, Miss Emily Wilbraham, instructs me to inform you that with the arrival on her premises at 7.30 this morning of the entire percussion section of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and several of, the, several of their friends, she has no course left to her but to seek an injunction to prevent you importuning her further. I'm making arrangements for the return of much assorted livestock. I am, sir, yours faithfully, G. Creep, attorney at law. <laughs> there, becomes a, there comes a moment in every Christmas when it gets to be a little much, doesn't it? and we laugh at the recognition that even we can go over the top. However, what's under the top or under our roof today are four of our members who play together as an ensemble and with the help of Lee Engstrom from time to time, they will give us some musical pauses between the merriment and the meaningfulness. I invite you to enjoy their wonderful gift. city boy, 
Uh, I do, I've lived, been in the country, lived in rural Massachusetts for 10 years, and family lived in Vermont, but I grew up in places like Washington, D.C., and Baltimore, went to school in places like St. Louis and Chicago, and spent time in uh, New York City before coming here. So the, the Christmas images that come to mind for me are usually urban ones. Uh, I, I know, why don't we sing silver bells anymore? Christmas time in the city. And if you've been around town, downtown, you've noticed they made an effort to hang up old decorations from when downtown was more of a destination. I live off of Lafayette, so you can see some of those old decorations there. And of course, if you've been to the Site Lab, former uh, public museum, there are some windows that are reconstructions of old. At any rate, I have three city poems that, ve that bear upon Christmas time. The two of them are by Phyllis McGinley, and one is by Edna St. Vincent Millay. City Christmas. Now is the time when the great urban heart more warmly beats, exiling melancholy. Turkey comes table d'hote or a la carte, our elevator wears a wreath of holly. Mendicant Santa Claus in flannel robes at every corner contradicts his label, alms asking. We have a tree with colored globes in our apartment foyer on a table. There is a promise or a threat of snow noised by the press. We pull our collars tighter and 20,000 doormen hourly grow politer and politer and politer. Office Party by Phyllis McGinley. Anyone here been to an office? I never did. I never went to it. We, we, well, we have cookies in the office. What can I say? <clears throat> this holy night in open forum, Miss McIntosh, who handles files, has lost one shoe and her decorum. Stately, the frozen chairman smiles. On media, desperately vocal, Credit, though they have lost their hopes of edging toward an early local, finger their bonus envelopes. The glassy boys, the bursting girls of copy, start a conga line to a swung carol, limply curls the final sandwich on the platter. Till hark, a herald messenger, room 414, lifts loudly up his quavering tenor. Salesmen stir libation for his lily cup. Noel, he pipes, Noel, Noel, some wag beats, tempo with a ruler, and the plump blonde from personnel collapses by the water cooler. There are ironies attached to Christmas, are there not? And I'll be talking about those later. I now have a poem, which is the reason why you have the title you have. This is not a Christmas poem, but it has Christmas elements in it, and that's why I chose it. It's called Recuerdo, which in Spanish means souvenir or member, remembrance. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. It was bare and bright and smelled like a stable, but we looked into a fire. We leaned across a table. We lay on a hilltop underneath the moon, and the whistles kept blowing, and the dawn came soon. We were very tired, we were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. You ate an apple and I ate a pear from a dozen of each we had bought somewhere. And the sky went wan and the wind came cold and the sun rose dripping a bucket full of gold. We were very tired, we were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. We hailed good morrow mother to a shawl covered head and bought a morning paper which neither of us read. And she wept, God bless you for the apples and pears. And we gave her all our money but our subway fares. I'm going to lead you into a time of prayer and meditation and then we'll listen to the lovely sounds of the instrumental ensemble again. I want you to think about a time a time, not a moment, but a time, a passage, whether it's a day or a night or a week or a, or a month, in which you felt alive, 
Now, we're all alive right now, I understand that, but most of the time we kind of phone it in, don't we? You know, the clock gets us up, we go to breakfast, we do the things we do. Even if coming to church is optional, it still feels like part of the mechanism of life. But there were moments, like the one you just heard about, when you became loose in the routine and you went back and forth all night on the ferry or you decided to play hooky from the world of expectation or something happened that woke you up to all that was there instead of paying attention to what you should be paying attention to. Do you have that moment, that time? Perhaps you were young. It doesn't have to be young, though, by no means. Perhaps you were unemployed and had no option, or perhaps you were wealthy, or perhaps you were alone, or perhaps you were with someone. Because this, this is the, these, this, I can't decide which. This is the journey of the Magi. When you take a step away from the path you would have taken to follow a star for no good reason except that it, it's there. Do you have that in your mind? Maybe you have several. Let's pray together. Oh, for the courage to step off the path. Oh, we'll go back to it eventually. And we will take care of the things that must be done, the tasks and the duties that must be completed. They are important. But they are important so that we have the moments between when we step off the path so that we can follow the star. Whatever that star was, we ask that it take us away into a wilderness of some kind, a wilderness meaning a place that is wild, where the wild things are, where we make the world with a purple crayon, where it seems as though everything is fresh and new and yet completely true and old and wise. Sometimes we come here hoping for that moment or likely to be reminded of those moments and for the courage, the nerve, the foolishness perhaps to seek another. For in the end, and there's always an end, we will have to surrender it all. And all the toys and all the duties and all the goods will have to be handed back. But if we have not savored the star, if we did not follow it at least for a day, we will look back and say, I missed something I should have done. So grant that we may see another star or two in our lives to step off the path into the woods, down to the beach, across a mountain, or just around a corner to behold what is always there if we but look up. Look up. Look up upon these things. We pause in silence and gratitude.
So, I made a mistake. That happens every day, by the way. Uh, it's one of my gifts. I'm really good at making mistakes. If you want to learn how to make more, I'll be glad to teach you. Uh, it turns out that, well, first of all, some backstory. In my previous churches, I had been in the habit of writing an original short story for Christmas Eve for about 15 years. But that didn't seem to work as well here just didn't feel like the room on Christmas Eve was a short story room. It needed something shorter and more sermonical. And so I've not done that. But they're good stories. I mean, I really don't care for many of my sermons, but I like my stories. And so about 10 years ago, uh, I actually read one on the Sunday that exists right here between the two holidays. It might have been Christmas Day itself, uh, which sometimes does fall on a Sunday. Years ago, someone said, uh, I think it was a board chair or maybe uh, my music director, 20-some, 30 years ago, said, it, since Christmas falls on a Sunday, should we cancel church? <laughs> and I said, no. But it's not a day people generally come to church, but I love it. And I'm sure I read, and I read this particular story then. It was eight to 10 years ago. And I'm banking on you for having forgotten it, which like all good meals happens. It takes its inspiration from the poem you heard by Edna St. Vincent Millay. It's called, We Were Very Merry. With something between a moan and a wail, almost like a siren, the Staten Island Ferry pulled into Whitehall, its metal sides rubbing the wet pilings into a weird, familiar song. A flurry of bubbling and churning rose as the engines reversed, and the crowd pushed reluctantly to the gates, for it was wet and cold, inhospitable to comfort of any kind. From the mid-deck, waiting passengers could see people below making good their escape, walking up the gangways and then parting as water does around a rock for an old man who was pushing a wire grocery basket very slowly in the opposite direction. Those having to slow and collide were annoyed, even more so as they came close and could tell that the man with the wire basket, the shopping cart, had not recently bathed. A few made muttering complaints, but all were eager to get on with their tasks, and so they hurried on. At the bottom of the stairway, he paused, then backing up the stairs, he bumped the grocery cart full of clothes and shoes up the stairs to the mid-deck, where he walked equally slowly to a row of blue plastic seats. Though the ferry was filling up again, now with commuters heading home early for the holidays, no one shared the bench of seats near him so that he had a zone of emptiness about him as far as smell would carry. He began to unpack his cart as if it were a suitcase, removing socks, shoes, pants, and shirts. At the bottom was a blanket, or something very like it, which he pulled out and spread on the bench, evidently for his personal and immediate use. Then he put the shoes back in, in plastic grocery bags, no less, and then the pants, and then his underwear and socks, then the shirts, and finally the jacket and coat he wore as he came on board. Sure enough, he settled himself for a long winter's nap, just as the churning and moaning began again, punctuated by a deep blast on the whistle announcing their departure. Now, not far away, but out of sight, 
was Edina, a seventh grade student at St. Basil's School, though she herself was Kosovar, and that meant Muslim, though neither she nor her family ever set foot inside a mosque. In the usual parochial uniform, visible under the open coat that flapped about, she was on her way to the apartment building where mom and dad were superintendents. As restless as the other was exhausted, she walked and skipped the length of the deck, alternating between grown-up and child, as most 13-year-olds do when they are alone. As you can predict, just as opposite poles of a magnet attract, Adina was bound to run into Ned. She launched through some doors and, not looking as she went, tripped over Ned's basket, sending it and herself sprawling. Oh, man, Edina said, angry with herself and seeing what it was. Screwing up her mouth with disgust, she pushed the stuff together, trying not to touch it and just enough to get out of the way. Then she stood up and was about to leave when Ned barked. Stop! That's my stuff, little lady, and you should clean up this mess. Yeah, right, she said with the sarcasm of the innocent and shrugged herself away from him. I insist. Ned said, with a firmness and clarity of voice that few would expect from someone of his appearance. And he held out an umbrella to bar her way from moving on. Edina was about to scream, not because she was frightened, but because it would get sympathy. And people around were looking, and their eyes were not sympathetic. Okay, she said with a mope and flopped down to gather the clothes, looking sideways at Ned with eyes like slits, keeping an eye on him and also conveying her disgust. Man, you smell, she said loudly. Not everyone has a bath at their disposal or a laundry, Ned said. How humiliating to have to clean up for a bum, she thought. Yeah, she did it. But what did it matter? He was only going to drag it from place to place anyway. It's not like it's all that precious, you know, or so she thought to herself. Good enough, she said demandingly, and was turning to leave when his hand caught hers and pressed a quarter into her hand. She was instantly embarrassed. Hey, hey, no, no, I I, I don't need, I don't deserve, no, you, you probably take it, he said. If I can scold, I can praise. And maybe if a few more adults did both well, we would all be better off. But I have, I have plenty. And you, you well, you, no, you need, it just isn't fair. Believe me, young lady, I know what's not fair. I did not get into this by my, I did not get to this all by myself, though I certainly did my best or my worst under the circumstances. Gee, said Adina. You don't sound like the guys I see in the city. Why are you so... She couldn't find the word. Long story, my young friend. You wouldn't be interested. Mm, I don't know. Maybe I would. And Ned began to tell about growing up in Indiana and being drafted and having to explain what drafted meant and going to Korea and explaining why Korea was important and how he ended up in New York after being mustered out at Fort Dix. She didn't know where that was until he mentioned Six Flags and how he was going to play the piano. So he came to New York and waited tables and washed dishes and went to clubs to hear Count Basie and Duke Ellington and Thelonious Monk and Earl Father Hines. He didn't even try to explain jazz. So you were famous, Adina asked, disbelieving, but of course wanting to believe. No, said Ned. Closest I came was jamming with a few of them after hours. Never got a steady gig. When I got, when I was lucky, I played some butterfly at some bar, and I filled in for Miriam at Partland when she was sick once. Who? Doesn't matter. I came close, but I never grabbed the ring. The ring? An old expression, youngster. It means winning. Oh, I'm going to be a winner. My Abba works very hard for me to go to St. Basil's, even if it is Christian. And I'm going to go to college and become a doctor, Adina said, with the conviction of those too young to know better. You want to be a doctor? Oh, yes. It's what Abba wants and what my whole family wants. But, But do you want it? Just for yourself. Well, everyone's told me for years, so I'm sure that's what I want. Good, said Ned, nodding. 
and fell silent. Somewhere in all this, the ferry docked at Staten Island, emptied, filled, and started back again, and docked at Whitehall, and emptied, and filled, and started back again. But Adina had not noticed. She still wanted to know more. So how did you, when she stopped not knowing how to ask, end up a bum? Adina nodded, slightly ashamed to be so transparent. Well, that was the point, wasn't it? And Ned got up and walked over to the window, looking out toward New Jersey, though the fog made it invisible. Adina followed him. Looking out the window, he spoke. I believed too much. I don't understand, said Adina. I kept on believing I would grab the ring, get a break, long after I should have moved on. I got pneumonia, I lost my job, then I lost my apartment. You know, it's hard to get jobs after a while, even off the books sort of work. They see the gray hair, the wrinkles, they hear the cough, and decide some younger guy is a better bet. And they're right. Everybody knew it was over except me. <clears throat> I felt really stupid for a while, then I realized I still had my dream. All those other people had given up theirs, sold it for wherever the going price is. Maybe, maybe I can't. Maybe I was meant to keep my dream even if it wouldn't come true. That doesn't make sense, said Adina. Well, <clears throat> you have to spend a lot of time on this ferry going back and forth, forth, back and forth, thinking about how it never gets anywhere, but what would the city be without it? You have to see how things kind of belong, even when they don't seem to work. Even when it doesn't seem to belong, it really does. You have to live out in the world like me to see how people are so close and yet never see each other or even anything else. Like, like when the big shot fellow once dropped a hundred dollar bill and I picked it up and I tried to catch it, catch him and give it back, but he thought I was trying to ask him for money so he wouldn't let me give him his money back. So I figured, well, he must have meant to give it to me and so I got a room at the Y and a fine jacket and I ate a big corned beef sandwich and I enjoyed every second and you know, he probably never missed that hundred dollar bill very much. So it's for sure, I really appreciated that money more than he did. Appreciate it. That's what I do. All day long, I appreciate. It's a full-time job, I discovered, and the pay is not as bad as you might think. For instance, I came over here because I know that on an evening like this, the lights around the Statue of Liberty go all kind of bright and blurry, and it gives her a halo. So she looks like an angel, and being Christmas Eve, it seemed like the place to be. There she is, see what I mean? And true enough. The familiar face was all soft and bright, and her torch was kind of undulating with the mist. The folds of her copper gown blended into the fog at the edges, so you couldn't see exactly where she ended and the mist began. It was wonderful. Now, who else is going to appreciate that? Someone has to, or God's gone to a whole lot of trouble for nothing. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, Ned began, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand. A mighty woman with a torch, Adina jumped in. She had just memorized this in class. And they continued to the very end, send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. The homeless, tempest tossed. She's standing there for me, young lady. She believes in me the way I believe in her. My mom and dad came here when their village was destroyed, said Adina. I wasn't even two, so I don't remember anything, but I suppose they were homeless and tempest-tossed too. So we are birds of a feather, as they say, said Ned. Wouldn't think so to look at us, I know, but neither of us would be here right now if it weren't for the lady and her dream. Most of these people around us, reading their papers and carrying their Christmas gifts, don't know that they are birds of a feather either, that they wouldn't be here right now if it were not for the lady and her dream. It's kind of like the Christmas story, the part about how the baby was born and only a few shepherds and animals noticed. Everybody else was just too busy to see that the most important thing was right there in front of them. There she is, the most important thing in America, and who notices? If not for her, they, they wouldn't be here. But do they see it? 
I'm glad she didn't stop believing even if they did. And, uh, and I think someone ought to appreciate that. And they stood there silently until the statue faded into the mist. Oh, my God! And Dina said with terrible recognition, I should have been home two hours ago. That's what believing will do to a person, Ned observed with a gentle finger. What am I going to do? They will absolutely kill me. Little lady, you just tell them the truth. You ran into an old friend and lost track of the time. We were very tired. We were very merry. We went back and forth all night on the ferry. That's another poem, she said. And Ned just smiled and kept reciting as the ferry shuddered into the dock. It was bare and bright and smelled like a stable, but we looked into a fire. We leaned across a table, and his voice was drowned out as she ran down the gangway. All she could catch was the first line of the stanza. And when she got home, running the whole way before her frantic Abba could ask, her first breathless words were those. We were very tired. We were very merry. We went back and forth all night on the ferry. So, looking back again to my New York days, it turned out that I lived right across the street from the house where W. H. Auden lived for a number of years when he was in uh, New York. So I became fond of his poetry and figured you ought to get to know the neighbors after all. And one of his greatest poems is a long one called For the Time Being, a Christmas oratorio. It's a very long poem, and it's meant to be almost dramatically read. It never is. It's very long. But 
It connects the two of us, that is, my New York past to my Grand Rapids present, or my Michigan present, because he actually wrote it when he was a visiting professor at the University of Michigan in 1943, during the middle of the war. And after the long poem, which is the story of the nativity with much comment about the times interladen, it comes to a close like this. Well, so that is that. Now we must dismantle the tree, put the decorations back into their cardboard boxes, some have gotten broken, and carry them up to the attic. The holly and the mistletoe must be taken down and burnt, and the children got ready for school. There are enough leftovers to do warmed up for the rest of the week. Not that we have much appetite, having drunk such a lot, stayed up so late, and attempted quite unsuccessfully to love all of our relatives, and in general grossly overestimated our powers. Once again, as in previous years, we have seen the actual vision and failed to do more than entertain it as an agreeable possibility. Once again, we have sent him away, begging, though, to remain his disobedient servant, the promising child who cannot keep his word for long. The Christmas feast is already a fading memory, and already the mind begins to be vaguely aware of an unpleasant whiff of apprehension at the thought of Lent and Good Friday, which cannot, after all, now be very far off. But for the time being, here we all are, back in the moderate Aristotelian city of Darning in the 815, where Euclid's geometry and Newton's mechanics would account for our experience and the kitchen table exists because I scrub it. It seems to have shrunk during the holidays. The streets are much narrower than we remembered. We had forgotten the office was as depressing as this. To those who have seen the child, however dimly, however incredulously, the time being is, in a sense, the most trying time of all. For the innocent children who whispered so excitedly outside the locked door where they knew the presence to be, grew up when it opened. Now, recollecting that moment, we can repress the joy, but the guilt remains conscious. Remembering the stable where, for once in our lives, everything became a you and nothing was an it and craving the sensation but ignoring the cause, we look round for something, no matter what, to inhibit our self-reflection. And the obvious thing for that purpose would be some great suffering. So once we have met the Son, we are tempted ever after to pray to the Father, lead us into temptation and evil for our sake. They will come all right. Don't worry. Probably in a form that we do not expect, and certainly with a force more dreadful than we can imagine. In the meantime, there are bills to be paid, machines to keep in repair, irregular verbs to learn, the time being to redeem from insignificance. The happy morning is over, the night of agony still to come. The time is noon when the spirit must practice its scales of rejoicing without even a hostile audience. And the soul endure a silence that is neither for nor against her faith that God's will will be done. That, in spite of her prayers, God will cheat no one, not even the world, of its triumph. Sometimes believing is believing despite all evidence to the contrary, which doesn't mean believing in fairies, although if you are Virginia O'Hanlon, that's considered necessary. It doesn't mean believing in things that are manifestly untrue. It means believing in things that ought to be true, and we know should be true, that ought to be present but aren't. Faith in what ought to be as well as what is present. That's the challenge for the time being, to continue to believe in summer, though the winter is in our midst. It's been always an honor to serve you, and as we come to the end of the year, I look with gladness upon the time we have been together. And remember that gratitude is not something we say every day, but every year, but something we say every day.